So uh, this is a Westland Lysander 3A built in Toronto. And uh, it was built in Malton by National Steel in 1942 in the same building that eventually built the And uh, the design is by Westland, and they're in England and southwest there in Somerset. And uh, there was a competition to replace an Army observation airplane, a contract from 1935. So uh, the head designer, Arthur Davenport and Teddy Header, uh, who owned Westland, they canvassed the opinions of RAF pilots and, you know, what would you like in, a, in an RAF observation airplane? And at the time, they, they were flying biplanes, the Hopper biplanes that were far too kind in the theory and things like that. So uh, the, the, the wish list from the pilots was uh, something that's safe to maneuver close to the ground. You know, you could maneuver it uh, aggressively and it's not going to snap a little spin on you. And then also they wanted some creature comforts because they were used to even dressing up in big sheepskin overalls even in the summertime. So they wanted a cabin that could be enclosed. They wanted a starter engine because the uh, Popular bike things a orchestral engine without a starter. You've got to have two guys, one of each side turning cranks, the other turns really slowly. Right. If you're really lucky and everything's adjusted just right, it takes off. Or there's a big Model T apparatus with an overhead shaft that engages the propeller hub and spins it up, right? So, but if you don't, if you're not at home, you can't get the engine started. So they wanted a starter, heat protection from the rain. They wanted to be able to land anywhere and uh, do their job, which was to take a general or some sort of observer, uh, probably a wireless operator, up over the battlefield and uh, take pictures or you know describe what was happening to the staff who were planning the next attack or defense. So in, in terms of satisfying that wish list, the airplane was very successful. And, uh, 1937, 1938, it was featured prominently in the newsreels of the time, in one of those British Cathay newsreels, and you can still see those on YouTube right now. And it was highly promoted as the airplane of the future, you know, it's streamlined and enclosed, and only has one wing, and has radio, and has lights, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, it was going to be the airplane that would prevent the next war. Of course, they didn't expect that. World War II would be so different from World War I. They, they had a, a battlefield trenches mentality, right? They expected to have a static war, and they didn't expect that the Germans were going to conquer France in May 1940 in two weeks. So they sent 170 of these over to, with the British Expeditionary Force to help the French, and uh, only about 40 or 50 came back. Uh, some of them were shot down, and a lot of them were uh, abandoned. Service. But the airplane was used very successfully in, uh, in other roles for the rest of the war. And uh, the pilots initially, you know, when they got a chance to check out in this in 1937, 1938, 1939, they really did like it. It was a big advance. Um, so uh, when it came, so in, in 1940, after they were looking for something else to do with it, um, they uh, they came up with a number of rules. So there is provision for a gun here, a 303. That's what this hole's for. And uh, two screws here. This one goes out and the next door is the ammunition. This is where the ammunition goes. So, and, and in some configurations, they had a rear gunner with either one or two machine guns. And where, these, where this plate is, you can remove that. Attaches a little stub wing, comes out about this far, and uh, they can hang things off that, even small bombs. Or, this next rule was this air sea rescue. So, if there was a pilot or crew down in the channel, this could fly over and drop a canister with a life raft in it. So, it, it functioned in that, that role. Uh, this one in Canada is configured uh, as a target for towing, uh, drove, for gunnery training. So there's this little set of bomb doors in there to open up. And then a big reel would be lowered with a thousand feet of line. And um, the end of that, it drove. So if it was, uh, say, a place like Baggerville, which was where the, our pocket hurricanes were, Canadian hurricanes, then they would be trying to learn how to shoot the drove, you know, practice. 
or if it was at one of the schools here in southern Ontario, like Jarvis, the, uh, there were fairy battles with turrets, right? And the turret gunners were trying to learn how to shoot a grove as well. So this one did that. And in fact, Don pointed out that some of the paint is wearing off under the uh, under the slats at the leading edge, and it's yellow. And that's some of that original paint from its bumblebee paint job, its Oxidol paint job in World War II. It was yellow and black in big stripes, so uh, hopefully the gunners would shoot the drogue and not the airplane. In fact, one of the jokes from the pilots of the tracers being closed was, hey guys, I'm pulling this, I'm not pushing it. <laughs> so it, this, that's how this was used, and they used those in England as well. But it achieved fame, or it's, you know, it's most well known for dropping spies off in France. So from uh, late 41 all, to, all until uh, Normandy, there was an operation called the Special Operations Executive. And they took uh, spies and dropped them off in France or picked up operatives there and uh, brought them back. And they didn't parachute in, the airplane landed. So the way that worked is uh, they would first of all fly on e a week on either side of the full moon. So it wasn't pitch dark, it had a little bit of light. And then they had trained the French uh, resistance fighters to pick a field for them so that the airplane wouldn't snag wires or trees, you know, something that had a reasonable chance of success, no big ditches in the middle. So uh, once a, a field had been agreed on and a flight arranged, this would fly over uh, from England it had a big drop tank underneath uh, the shape of a torpedo because it's a fairly thirsty engine. But the power settings they were using would be at 50 imperial gallons an hour. And that's two hours to dry tanks. Uh, like that's a 95 imperial gallon tank in the main. So we needed this extra fuel. So we would fly low level and it's quite quiet. They had it painted, you know, matte black so it wouldn't be too obvious. And all the exhaust from that uh, Bristol Mercury, and this is an original Bristol Mercury engine, is collected at the front in this uh, cowl, front, leading edge, and then gathered and sent down that exhaust tube so it's actually quiet. So it, has, you know, it wasn't really obvious as it was flying. And then when they got to the field, they didn't turn on the lights. Now, back here, uh, well, there's a hatch just like this. It's on the other side, it's located right here. There's two great big tubes and the pilot could release a parachute flare. Great big magnesium flare on a parachute, right? And he could light up a whole pasture and at the front edge of the spats, the two great big landing lights. So you could light, light up the field, but if you did that, of course, you'd be telling the Gestapo exactly where you were. And uh, so they didn't do that. Instead, they'd have three guys in the pasture shining flashlights. So three lights, one here, one here, and then one either on that side or one on this side, like an L. And um, the Lysander would, would plump it on the ground in between, turn back according to the leg of the L, and it would be taxiing back. And as it taxied back, uh, some spies would be jumping out, some other ones jumping on, right? So they had a ladder welded to the side of the fuselage. And the pilot might not even stop completely. They sure wouldn't shut down. Some of them had a pistol drawn in case, you know, things went bad at the last moment. And then they uh, turn around and just take off again before, of course, the Germans showed up. So these were high-risk operations, uh, not just operationally, but because also the French resistance was fairly well penetrated by the German uh, Gestapo and other espionage, uh, counter espionage agencies. Nobody ac actually understood how much until after the war. Some people, Canadians like uh, Cliff Stewart, who's honored on the side of the airplane, he did, and his code name was W5, just, just like 007. That was his actual code name. He went in five times. And he was teaching the French resistance about radios, and codes, and ciphers, and explosives, and detonators, and sabotage, all that kind of thing. And uh, he made it back. And he, he wouldn't talk about it. He said, I have been sworn to secrecy under the uh, Secrets Act, and I'm not allowed to say anything. And that he, he never did, right? To, right in 2010, we took this out to Summerside PEI, put him in it, tried to get him to tell stories, you know. He said, no, I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> but all, after the war in uh, Summerside, he was the guy that everybody took their radio to, or their early new television to, 
to, to get fixed, right? Because he understood vacuum tubes and how to service those things. Uh, very high risk operation, but it was successful, uh, particularly from a flight operations point of view. Didn't lose all that many bystanders. Um, sometimes they lost the crew if uh, the airplane bogged down in mud or something like that. But uh, it was quite rare. It was a, it was a program that uh, it was independent. It was a stealthy black program. They had one particular airfield or half of an airfield uh, south of London. Then they'd stage down to the coast, refill, go back, and they didn't lose too many airplanes. So that, that's what it's known for now. There are three Lysanders flying in the world, two in, in England, and uh, this one in Canada. And uh, this is the only one in North America flying, and the only Bristol Mercury fly, uh, operating, you know, actually flying in Canada. So uh, it's uh, something I really try to baby and capture, because the parts are just kind of tainy. The, uh, this airframe came from a Saskatchewan surplus, sale, and uh, right after the war, the hardware stores uh, didn't have any stock, right, there were still wartime shortages, you couldn't buy switches, you know, electrical switches, you couldn't buy valves, you couldn't buy wiring, anything like that, so an airplane like this, you could pay a couple hundred dollars for it, and then strip all the wires and get some pieces out of it, use them in the house, you can find the shed, whatever, so that's where these handles go, and, uh, you know, the, air, the wings would be cut off or removed or whatever, and they would generally just disappear. They'd be stacked in the back of the barn until they got all smashed up. But the uh, fuselage would be a little bigger, tended to be parked in a fence row or up behind the barn, and tended to survive. And a guy named Harry Harriet in Cinnaboy, Saskatchewan, was a pilot, farmer, and uh, collector. Uh, he collected a lot of stuff, all kinds of airframes, including our, also our uh, Hawker Hurricane Mark 12. And uh, he, I think he had three of these and assembled one out of it. And he never got this flying because the, uh, the Mercury needed an overhaul. Uh, and uh, that was difficult even back in, in the 1990s when he got it all put together. So he sold it to us and then we, were, we took it right back. It replaced most of the woodwork, all the fabric, of course, and, um, and uh, you know, restored the airplane. But it's very, very original. I mean, None of this is modern. These, you know, we've cleaned up a lot of the sheet metal and that sort of thing, but I tried to not close to the dents up, although it dents pretty easy. But um, uh, it's very much an original airplane. It's not a, uh, a, da a data plate restoration in any way, shape, or form. So you've got to get Harry Wariat and those other early guys and, and the collectors who keep barns full. Vince O'Connor there and Uxbridge, people like that, you've got to give them credit. Uh, they had a longer vision than those people did. Uh, Harry's passed away, but uh, we keep in touch with his son, Jane, and uh, send him pictures whenever we do anything noteworthy with either this airplane or our Hurricane 12, which came from the same farm. So I'm going to talk about how to fly it, but are there any questions about the history? Okay. Where is she built? About 1,800, 200, 225 duck here in Canada. Uh, they, they were looked at by bush operators after the war because you can lift anything you can get in the cabin. But unfortunately, you can see it from the other side. The, uh, it's all steel tubing and you can't just open it up and make a, a cargo area in there. So, uh, you know, the cargo, the bush up, you know, the Max Ward sort of people after the war, they looked at it and said, Nah, there's no way to uh, make money to this, you know, you can fly it, but that's it. Some of them were used briefly as prop dusters because you could put a different tank in there in the middle that was uh, half uh, you know, pesticide and half gas, uh, but that didn't last too long. So it didn't really have a civilian uh, purpose after the war. And the Bristol Mercury didn't have a civilian purpose either. It wasn't really put on a commercial airliner. The Hercules was, you know, the sleeve valve. Bristol made two different sets of engines, sleeve valve engines, like the Bristol Centaurus, it's on the Sea Fury, which is two banks of nine, and the Bristol Hercules, which is two banks of seven. And the Her Hercules was in many commercial airplanes, like the Bristol Freighter and others. So you can still get parts for, for them, but not uh, Bristol Mercury. 
This only equipped a few wartime airplanes, like the Gloucester Gladiator and uh, the Blenheims, Bowling Brokes that were built here in Canada. Uh, so they're just, it's really hard to find parts. And if anybody knows where there are parts for Bristol Mercury, please tell me, because uh, they're being hoarded. You know, it's really hard to find. Any what other? What kind of takeoff and land distances do you do with them? Uh, yeah, it's very short. If you have any kind of wind like today and you're pointed into the wind, and it's a firm surface, and you decide to use full boost for takeoff, full power for takeoff. That's just a few, a few lengths, really. But it's a weird takeoff technique because the flaps and slats. So we finished with history. Should I get into the? <laughs> so the flaps and slats are completely automatic. You can't lock them in. Can't lock them out. Can't extend them. Can't retract them. I'll show you how they work. So. They're linked. The inner ones are linked to each other and also the flaps. So like I say, you can't extend them, you can't retract them, you know, manually by your own a lever or anything like that in a cockpit. So they just start coming out when the angle of attack increases. The outer slaps are the same thing, but there's no, uh, they just do their own thing. So that makes it a little complicated. And there are ramifications to that. Uh, for example, takeoff technique. Actually, typically, in a, a lot of tail draggers, you'll get the power up, make sure you're straight, and then you'll push the tail up. You know, at a reasonable rate so you don't kick sideways, but a reasonable rate so you can see where you're going. Right? But these are angle of attack. Um, operating. So you'll start off, uh, everything will be extended fully, like the, well, like, like the other ones are right now. Uh, but if you push the tail up, angle of attack decreases, these ones retract and then you roll apart. So what I do is uh, I just lift the tail wheel about an inch, right? just, just off the ground, and, just, and then the thing magically pops off the ground at a big level levitation. That's a bit different. Yeah. So it's a, it's a challenging airplane to fly because it has gotchas like that that you have to think about. Uh, the first one, probably the most significant one, is the elevator is not big enough to control the airplane at either end of the envelope. So if you're coming in on approach and you're at 80, which is a good controllability speed, it's nowhere near the stall speed. Uh, but if you're coming in at 80, that's fine. And you have the trim in the middle, and then you come in to flare and pull the power off, the thing will just nose dart into the ground, even if you have the stick locked into your gut. And conversely, if you decide to put go-around power on, trim in the middle to uh, you know try it again, um, the airplane will go for the moon, even if you put the stick into the instrument panel. Yeah, so what they did at West of Westland way back when. Is they didn't redesign the tail when they discovered that unfortunate habit. Instead, they put the horizontal stabilizer on the actual heads right here. And so that's your both your trim device, and it, it also uh, gives you the authority, the control authority, you know, to, for a nose up or nose down attitude. So we have this line painted right here and that's a guide for the ground crew so they can tell you if you're, uh, when, you're when you're winding the trim back and forth before engine started for getting the full range and also if you leave it somewhere near where you're going to need to take off and we take off with it mistrimmed actually in a nose up situation so that if you lost the engine it would be right. you can stop it just like a nose to control authority and you have to land and you just nose to our thing. so as soon as you get airborne in the states it's uh so uh, when it comes to landing, um, we come in at about 80, I'm talking about the trim here now, and then what I do is at uh, about 200 feet above the ground, which is I treat as a commit point, I, um, I, put, I, I lock the stick, so lock my elbow, hold the stick in one spot so it can't come back and then start winding the trim all the way back so that, you know, 10, 15 seconds later when it's time to flare, I can pull the power off and I will have the authority to three-point it. And 
that's the way it lands best, a three-point landing. If you wheel it on at 80 miles an hour, it, it's very much still a climb speed. So that's fine, but if you, if, you, um, if you let the tail down a little early, and it's a heavy tail, because it, want, it wants to sink. So if you let the tail down and you're still doing 70 or 75, the flaps and slats will extend more, and you go lofting back up into the air, and then the drag suddenly increases like crazy, and then uh, you're, you're 20 feet up, you know, with no airspeed. The Bristol Mercury is a carbureted engine, and it has an accelerator pump that is about three times bigger than it needs to be. And if you jam the throttle in that situation, you kill it with a rich mixture. So there you are, 20 feet up, engine dead, no airspeed. <laughs> so I prefer to three-point it. Yeah, I do wheel land. If I do wheel land it, I make a big effort to keep the uh, tail up as long as possible. And it, like I say, it's a heavy tail, so you're not going to go on its on its nose. Anyway, so that's the way I uh, I, I handle the, that uh, elevator aspect. So that's the first gotcha on the airplane. The second, on approach with all these flaps and slats, if you put the nose up or down, they just go in and out. And every time they do that, your lift vector changes and your drag changes. So, you know, if you're coming in on approach and uh, you're a little high maybe and you lower the nose, which you shouldn't anyway, but if you did lower the nose, they retract, speed goes up, drag goes down, you go shooting way long. Same thing if you're a little low and you pull the nose up, they extend, drag goes up, and then uh, speed comes back and you start dropping like a rock and then you've got that same accelerator pump issue that you've got to be careful of. So, you don't want to be doing this on approach because uh, things get you, you get 180 out of phase and you look like a slinky coming down steps. <laughs> Very embarrassing. So the way I fly it like the steerman there, I fly it like a big biplane, where uh, at the end of the downwind leg, you get the nose up, and that's how you extend the flaps. The nose of the airplane is your flap lever. No matter what it does to your circuit altitude, you don't care about that. So you get the nose up, so you can get. Uh, you get at 80 miles an hour, and they're, they're, they're these, these inner ones would be about half out at that point. And then get that established, trim for 80 miles an hour. And then you put on a power setting that's approximately the right rate of descent up for the rest of the uh, base leg and final. And then, as required, you just side slip it, just like you would a steerman there. And uh, that works fine because it doesn't mess up or change the slats and flaps, and uh, you can vary your rate of descent. And, uh, or, you know, touch down more or less for the month. So that's that's the way I, I do that. And it may not be how the guys in England do it, but that's that's where I'm doing it. So far, I kept it in one piece. I don't imagine um, it's a ball of fire on cruising. What speed do you get in cruising? Yeah, well, that's all about uh, um, economy, right? It's a 95 Imperial gallon tank, and uh, if you if you keep a high positive boost on a supercharged engine. It'll, it would burn 75 gallons an hour. So we pull it back, but then it's not good to pull a supercharged engine back too much, right? It's better to push supercharger seals in place than, than have the power back and it kind of want to be drawn out. So somewhere in there, there's a balance. It's not a constant speed prop. It's two position, four or five. You take off with it, fine, like, you know, it's like a two gear car, right? So you take off with it in first gear, fine pitch. As soon as you get airborne, you pull it in course, and that's all you've got for the, for the whole flight. So then when it comes to cruise power settings, you're kind of juggling uh, uh, a boost setting. Again, it's a supercharged engine with um, a, hopefully a low RPM, which will preserve the radio. So uh, where I, where I, the power setting that I settled on is both a smooth spot, which you, know, you listen and you feel for, like that. And um, it gives me about 150, 145 to 150 miles an hour indicated and burns about 30 imperial gallons an hour. So I'm about three hours to dry tanks. And two hours is plenty, lots of time to fly this side. Uh, it's really hot, hot, hugely hot. This is a, an oil cooler exhaust. This is a slot right here. The big, the two big vents in the front, the big tubes. Air for the oil coolers, and they're very efficient. Um, this thing flew fine in the desert. It would have been punishingly hot for the uh, 
for the pilots because all the plumbing for all that oil stuff, all those lines, it's right there below you. There's a lot of heat comes off the firewall and the uh, oil tank is on the uh, cockpit side, it's up there, uh, of the firewall. So it's uh, a really hot uh, airplane to fly. Big blast of heat comes up from below the entire time. There, uh, you can enclose, there's panels that slide out from below and top and back, so you can enclose it up there, but I, I keep the side windows about this far open, and uh, there's one happy place there that's not too noisy, like, uh, and uh, there's enough air. And I soak my flight suit with water on a hot day before I get into it. Cool. It was not a comfortable airplane to fly. <laughs> but it's kind of fun to chug along, and, couple thousand feet, a couple of farms and fields, and to know that if the engine quit, you, can, you could have a good chance of landing in any little grass strip, any Piper Cup strip, you can have a, a good shot at, you know, if the engine were to fail. Uh, the other gotchas on the airplane, um, the brakes aren't going to allow us uh, It's a free swiveling, free caster, tail wheel, and lock it straight, no tail wheel, no tail wheel steering. And the brakes are standard to pneumatically powered uh, air brakes, sh drum brakes, shoe brakes. And, uh, you know, we, in our collection, we fly Spitfire and Hurricane, and they work fine in that. And it's, it's powered by, uh, or it's activated by, uh, you can see it up there, it's a bicycle grip that's on the spade grip extension of the control stick. Have you to squeeze that lever, and if your rotor pedals, it's actually a rotor bar, like a little one airplane, if it's in the middle. But anyway, if the rudders are in the middle, you get even braking, and if the rudders are displaced, you get asymmetric braking, theoretically. But it, it depends on if the little diverter valve is giving the same amount of air to each wheel. And there's a gauge up there, it's a triple gauge, and the top needle shows you the pressure in the bottle, reserve pressure, and the bottom two needles show you the amount of air pressure that's going to reach brake. And uh, if you're on a rollout, and if you decided to use the brakes to slow down, which I don't do that, but you could, then you squeeze the lever, you have to glance down there and make sure that you're not getting one needle more than the other. And this is while you're rolling out, because otherwise, it, and then, it, then while you're squeezing it, you have to move the rudder a little bit to even those out, so then you can squeeze and actually get brake. And who knows where you're going by the time you've done all that. <laughs> so that, Ground handling is a problem with this airplane. Originally, 1935, you know, they were just operating out of a big 15-acre, 20-acre grass field. Didn't matter. Three-pointed in the grass, and uh, you know, go to the end, and then the, the, uh, the ground crew would, would hook on and tow you where you had to go. Uh, so for them, it was easy. But for these little modern airports with skinny taxiways and no way to do an S turn. Um, and it's hard to ask turn this thing anyway, like we just said. Uh, it's a challenge. And on a day like this, today with southwest wind, if I had to go out there and land or take off on 25, uh, I would have to taxi pretty much downwind. Or, and what I probably, probably would arrange would be a support vehicle to go behind. And if I ran out of brake, ran out of ability to stop the tail from being blown around, you know, weathercock, um, I would stop. And, Person would jump out of the vehicle. Put your shoulder in this bulkhead right here and kick me straight. And I have another shot for a few hundred more yards until I want to drop again. So that's the way you you have to think about ground handling in this. It's like a ski plane or a float plane. It's not about the touchdowns. What do you do afterwards to get to the dock or wherever you have to park? Um, and uh, that's a very major consideration. Sometimes you have one brake working better than the other. Right now the right brake's working really well. Left one, so-so. Well, it might be better for me to make 270 degree turns than a 90, you know, depending on which way the wind is and which way the airplane's going to weather fly. So you think about that. Like I say, in the air, it's a nice airplane. Runs nice and cool. The, um, I mean, the engine runs cool. The cylinder temperatures are quite low. Oil temperature is quite low. You close those gills, close the towel flaps uh, right after takeoff. And uh, the maneuvers quite well. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen any of my videos, but I, I do have an air show video of the Lysander. And it's not just banana passes, it's uh, active maneuvering in front of the crowd. It does a great job. Very simple. Very 
be very simple and safe to do that. But on the ground, that is challenging. So, what else? So, uh, this particular uh, history, yeah, we bought it from the farmer. And this is Mike Potter from uh, Ottawa. I think he's been a benefactor of this organization. Yeah, it's too. Right. 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 He put a tent up over here. He put a tent up. Yeah, he, he's a quiet guy, but he can be generous. And uh, uh, he paid for the restoration of this. And then in 2019, uh, he sold it to a Toronto gentleman named John Carswell. And uh, John was in the RCEF in the early 80s, but then got out later, became a businessman and an investor, and uh, developed a big investment company, like quite large. They do uh, pension funds. Maybe teachers' funds, I don't know, but, but big, big asset funds. And uh, he's, he named two of his companies after the airplane. So Lysander Funds is one of his investment firms with a particular target audience. And the other is Canso Funds. Canso. And he picked those names because his dad, Andy Carswell, flew both those airplanes in 1945, 1946 in the RCAF. In fact, Andy got an Air Force Cross for uh, landing a Canso out in the ocean off the west coast rescuing people on the ship. Yeah. Andy was with transport for many years in the 60s, 70s. Maybe somebody would have worked with him at some point. So um, when this airplane went up for sale, his son, uh, John, stepped up to the plate and said, that airplane should not be in Canada, and bought it, and then set up standard historical aviation. And uh, that's the uh, organization now that's supporting it. On the road, and it's an expensive airplane to, you know, if we need parts, they're really hard to find. Uh, you have to be uh, clever and resourceful to, to keep this thing serviceable. And our maintenance team is in Tech Arrow from Gatineau Airport. It's always been in Tech Arrow and they maintain it. Uh, and so far, you know, I got it to Oshkosh, came back this far, I have a pretty good chance to get them back home again. Carswell wrote a book called Over the Wire. I don't know if anybody's seen that one. And he was a Lancaster pilot and uh, got shot down uh, fairly early. He didn't get too many missions in. Shot down near Berlin and then made a number of escape attempts before the end of the war. So that's why his book is called Over the Wire. It's worth reading. Good book. He only died uh, last year, I think. He, he went to over 100. All right. I'm going on and on here. Any, any questions? Insurance yeah. <laughs> well, it is insured, both for haul and liability. Um, and that's, it's expensive, but I have an asset. Um, that's what I say, John stepped up to the plate and paid the bills, and insurance is a big part of that. Marsh. Well, I don't, yeah, Marsh is the uh, underwriter. And then we deal with a broker and, uh, and all of that. And uh, you know, you can buy, you can always buy insurance. It's just a question of how much. Uh, when we took it to Oshkosh, I had to have a separate rider put on. They insisted uh, for uh, insured for aerial displays. Their, their insurance in the states is going crazy. Uh, at least I think, my opinion is anyway. And it kind of rubs off everywhere because insurance is global. Not national. Now, earlier you were talking about when they flew into France, uh, obviously there's only one seat for a passenger, but uh, you mentioned earlier, I can't remember what you said about putting people, other people inside the aircraft at the same time. Yeah, so this back cockpit can be configured different ways. Uh, I believe they probably kept this canopy on, but I, I don't know. They probably might not even have had that. And they had a ladder bolted to the side of the aircraft. There are two flying in England, uh, one at Duxford and one at Shuttleworth. At least one of those airplanes flies with the ladder, so you can see pictures of that. And as soon as it slowed down, yeah, some people would be, uh, you know, bailing out and trying to get on the tail, and other people would be climbing on board. And there wouldn't necessarily be anything in there. And they'd also be throwing out packages if, if, that, if they were, uh, radios and things. And um, it, yeah, they put up to five people in the back, but they would have been on top of each other, and uh, they would have been motivated, of course, if they were being chased by the Germans, right? 
squeeze into a small spot if you had to. It's a wireless telegraphy significant point, um, either for grounding, I think it's for grounding. Don, do you know the answer to that? The, the WT thing? No? Yeah, it's, it stands for a wireless telegraphy access point, significant place. I should look that up. We don't use it, that's just the original markings. In fact, we have a picture of this in 1942, just rolled out of the factory. And we pretty much we recreated the same picture with exactly the same, you know, same point of view, same point of view, same point of view. I mean, actually, a few years ago, you said, why are the slats in the flaps sort of the pilot that have to go Because it's more complicated and more difficult to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> so, it seemed like a good idea. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> lots of airplanes have the automatic. Flats, right? That's uh, say F-86 Saber, M109, uh, lots of the moth biplanes, uh, not Tigers, but they were taken off from the Tigers, the Canadian Tigers, but the British Tigers are in front of the Amazon on the top. So that's a 1921, I think, handling page pattern. But to link them up with the flaps is a little bit point that I know that does that. And, uh, but the design goal is it's the original hands-on throttle and stick, which was a on throttle and stick, and it's very much like that in this airplane. You can maneuver quite aggressively when both slats and flaps are going out. Oh, one other aspect is when the slats go out, if the flaps go out at the same time, there's no trim change. It's happening on both sides of the center So that helps a lot. You, know, you don't have to wind the trim. You wind the trim based on speed, but not through the deployment of these devices. So, so they did get that. that right. Maybe I didn't get quite fair play. But it is very complicated under there. Um, I don't have any pictures of it right now. It's the fabric off, but uh, there's all kinds of sprockets and chains, and there's some springs, and there's one um, uh, oleo sort of uh, movement dampener in that circuit. You can see the sprockets and chain technology on the front of the Lancaster center section. It's the same, same technology. Is this slats? Yeah. No slats, but it's got the sprockets and chains on top. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of engineering, it, it, it works, but it's complicated. It's like the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which I, I buy and like a lot, but it's a, a V12, a, you know, originally a thousand horsepower, just like the Allison, Allison V12, but it has, uh, the Allison has 60% as many parts as the Merlin. Same sort of thing. The British uh, never, never held back from using more parts. <laughs> and of course, these are all Whitworth and weird threads, right? Yes, you have how many hours when you put on the engine? Yeah, well, that's a very sobering, yeah, it's a sobering thought. Uh, it's not a commercial engine, it's designed like an R2, 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 R
that rarely happens. You lay up all winter, and then it's expensive, uh, so there's kind of a incentive to not pile up the hours on it, which may not be the best thing for the engine. You know, they're doing those rides, and anyone now with a Spitfire since they opened up the regulations, right? There's no more of this join uh, organization and you get to fly your airplane. We've, we've now there are exemptions, right? You guys operate under yeah. exemption to your rides, and that's made the whole program better and more honest. And uh, they're doing that in England, and there's three different ride outfits for Spitfires. So um, they, they fly their Spitfires every day, lower power settings. And uh, they're getting uh, lots of uh, time out of their engines. Phoenix Award, we won a silver wrench for each of those, so that's four trophies, plus the judges' appreciation. So, uh, we're very happy to get back in Canada. Yeah, well done. Yep. Yeah. 